birth of the Mersey Railway had not been an easy one. Due to geological difficulties, the line had far steeper gradients than the company would have wanted. This in turn required powerful locomotives that led to the largely underground line becoming very unpleasant with fumes. Although ventilation was provided it made little difference. The company also had to provide passenger lifts for the deep level platforms, and pumping stations both sides of the river to extract the water constantly entering the tunnels. All this cost money, and due to the foul atmosphere, passengers were reluctant to use the line. Another blow to the company was dealt by Birkenhead's council. By 1890 they had extended and electrified their tramway system, and retimed both the trams and ferries to provide clean and convenient transport to Liverpool. At Liverpool's pier head, onward travel into the city and beyond was also becoming more convenient, with their ever-expanding tramway system. All these improvements only made the Mersey Railway's situation worse. The adoption of electric traction was clearly the only way out of the tunnel of debt the Mersey had found itself in. In 1896 the Mersey promoted a bill in Parliament to convert their line to electric operation, but being so in debt this was something that they were unable to pursue at the time. The opening of the Liverpool Overhead Railway in 1898 had showed him that electrification was clearly the way forward. Opened and operated throughout by electric trains, this clean and efficient form of traction would be the saviour of the Mersey Railway. The financial troubles that the company was in, meant that investors were reluctant to put any more into the failing business. The unfortunate shareholders were regularly disappointed in the director's reports, such as this one. The overhead railway was electrified with equipment provided by the Electric Construction Company, and inquiries into the possibility of contracting the same company for the Mersey were looked into. Unfortunately the state the Mersey was in meant they simply couldn't raise the capital necessary. Luckily for the Mersey, the American Westinghouse Company, formed in 1886 by George Westinghouse, was looking to break into the British and European markets. They had established a factory here at Trafford Park Manchester in 1899 and saw that the dilemma that the Mersey was in, could be solved by the very products they wanted to promote. Westinghouse offered to provide all the generating plant, cables and installation. As well as this they would build all the electric stock to operate the lines. Because of the financial state of the Mersey, they would provide all this for shares in the company. The thinking behind this was to provide a showcase of Westinghouse products to promote their company. The British Westinghouse work on electrifying the Mersey Railway commenced in 1901 and was complete by 1903. The electricity for the line would be provided by their own generating station to be built at Shaw Road. The Mersey Railway power station was built next to the existing pumping station, the chimney becoming a local landmark for many years. The site is now a substation for the national grid. Seen here is one of the Westinghouse 3000 kW turbines driving two 1500 kW DC generators. The upper gallery housing the switchgear. The power was then fed into the line via the ventilation shafts. Seen here is the high power cables feeding the line. The railway was to be electrified on the fourth rail system, the center rail being the current return. Also seen here is one of the Westinghouse automatic tripcock train stops added later. After the electrics had been introduced, the steam locomotives and stock were put up for sale. The locomotives had no problems in being sold. The passenger rolling stock on the other hand was so embedded with grime it was only fit for scrap. One locomotive, Cecil Rakes, was bought by Shipley Colliery and has survived to this day. It's planned to go on permanent display at a new museum, the transport shed, to be built in Birkenhead. Before the new electric service was launched all the stations were given a thorough clean, and the underground station roofs whitewashed. The new electric trains were a vast improvement on the old choking steam services, and passenger numbers began to rise. All was not 100% however. The Westinghouse company had cut their costs to the bone and cut corners. Problems were to be found in the power station. The boilers had insufficient capacity for the engines, amongst other issues. There was current leakage in the track work and problems also were found with the trains. The first one collided with the platform at Hamilton Square Station. Litigation and negotiations behind closed doors were to drag on for a few years as Westinghouse, eager to avoid embarrassment for their shoddy workmanship, worked to rectify the faults. The units provided for the line were to a very American design. With open-ended platforms and clearstory roofs, and were a much-needed improvement on the old steam stock. One unusual feature of the new trains was they didn't have an onboard compressor. 
When the units arrived at their destination they were charged with air via a hose, and attached to a receptacle in the platform as demonstrated here. The electric service did prove to be a great success, and passenger numbers increased steadily. Although it would be many years before the Mersey had cleared its debts. With the turnaround of the Mersey company, proposals were investigated into ways of maximizing the usefulness of the line. In 1914, one proposal was to extend the Mersey railway in a loop round the city linking the stations at Liverpool Exchange and Lime Street, before rejoining the existing line. This diagram produced at the time, shows this proposed new line, highlighted in red. The intervention of the First World War would see this plan not become a reality for another 63 years. The increase in passengers meant that additional stock was soon needed, and tender documents were sent out to various contractors. The winning contractors were Cravens of Sheffield. The new stock differed in having elliptical roofs. This appendix to the working timetable shows the typical train consist. One problem with the Mersey was that of through traffic. Passengers from the Wirral Railway's West Kirby and New Brighton branches had to change at the windswept station at Birkenhead Park. Work to resolve this issue was not to be proposed until long after the Wirral lines had become part of the LMS in 1923. When government grants became available, the LMS embarked on electrifying the Wirral lines in 1937. By 1938 the works were complete, and included 19 new three-car electric trains. These were very advanced for the time and featured air-operated sliding doors. Built jointly by Birmingham Railway Carriage and Wagon and Metropolitan Camel. They featured very comfortable interiors. The driver's cabs were basic and this work manual diagram shows the cab layout. Most Wirral stations were also rebuilt to an Art Deco style, further improving the quality of the lines. Additional improvements included a brand new depot to house the new trains. One line not to be electrified was the branch to Seacom. The Wirral passengers could now enjoy through trains to Liverpool Central. Sadly the storm clouds of the Second World War were soon looming, and the Wirral and Mersey lines were to find themselves a target for enemy action. During the May Blitz of 1941 the Mersey stations at Central, James Street and Birkenhead Park were to suffer bomb damage. At James Street the surface booking hall and lifts were totally destroyed, passengers having to use the Water Street subway until a replacement building and lifts could be built. The booking office at Park Station was also destroyed. A number of trains were also lost, including four coaches of the then still new LMS electric trains. Also the new purpose-built shed for the LMS trains was completely obliterated. The devastation is clearly seen here. In the background can be seen one of the recently built LMS electrics has been blown apart. Redundant stock from London Transport was transferred to the Mersey lines but ultimately not needed. The nationalisation of the railways in 1948 saw the end of the Mersey Railway's independence, but the old Mersey trains were to soldier on for a few more years. By 1955 the need to replace this ageing stock was apparent. The replacement stock was to be a second, almost identical batch of the LMS designed trains. These were introduced in 1956, and included four coaches to replace those lost in the war. There were to be 24 of these new trains, and as they were introduced, a Mersey train went for scrap. Only one of the original Mersey Railway electric motor coaches was to be saved for preservation, and was to go on display at the Liverpool Museum. Sadly the coach was destroyed in a paint shop fire at Derby Works, and this link to the Pioneer Mersey Railway was lost. With the lines now operated fully by the sliding door stock, the ramshackle look of the Mersey lines was transformed. The Mersey railway lines however were now just another part of British Railways and its story seemed to be over. The threats to the railways brought by Dr Beeching passed the Mersey by. Shutting such a vital cross-river route would never have been acceptable. But things were afoot. A 1960s revival of the 1914 plans would see the Mersey railway become a vital part of a new and very successful rapid transit network. This story of the planning and building of this major transformation will be told in the final part of the Mersey Railway story. The building of the Mersey Rail, Loop and Link.